my co-panelists have been giving me a bit of a hard time because I, I actually have a PowerPoint. Um, but as you'll see, uh, I think I have many of the same insights that we've, we've already heard. So even though we're from different disciplines, I think we're kind of converging on at least what are some of the challenges of <laughs> making our different disciplines work together. Um, so I really kind of welcome the chance to give a few insights uh, from my own perspective as a political scientist. Um, I'm actually a daughter of a sociologist and I'm married to an economist. So I'm kind of, you know, always thinking about these different issues and, uh, you know, when it, when it does and it doesn't work uh, very well. So what I thought I'd do is just talk briefly first about some of the challenges I think uh, political scientists uh, sometimes face in working in multidisciplinary environments. As Rachel mentioned, I've worked both at, at WIDER, where it's majority development economists, and now at IFPRI, where um, it's about 500 ag economists, and, uh, and myself as a political scientist. Um, so some of the challenges of, of being kind of a minority, what I'm calling a minority political scientist. And then um, just some brief insights um, that very much complement um, what, what the other panelists have said about uh, uh, what, when can you, can you get multidisciplinary work to, to happen um, based on my own experience working in multidisciplinary teams or leading multidisciplinary projects. So focusing on the first issue um, as kind of a minority political scientist experience, I mean, some of the, the challenges uh, that I think we face is first, and I think this is actually faced not just for political scientists, but across different disciplines, but is conflating disciplines with methodologies. Um, and, uh, you know, thinking perhaps that if you work on governance issues or political issues that you only use qualitative methods, um, or as one of my colleagues calls qualitative blah, blah, you do qualitative blah, blah, um, which is not just kind of, you know, <laughs> derisive of qualitative methods, which, which as we know, can be quite robust and rigorous, um, but, uh, but ignoring that quite a substantial share of political scientists also use quantitative methods. But relatedly, um, I think we've also seen um, within political science, we've kind of seen a lot of kind of methodological hegemony, uh, particularly with the popularity of experimental work and RCT work, um, really starting to crowd out some really interesting and important research questions that are maybe you know, difficult to have, your, your randomized experiments, um, or you know, just can't be very easily quantified. And if you look at kind of our flagship journal, which is the American Political Science Review, um, it's almost uniformly experimental work that, that you're seeing now. Um, and then I think thirdly is just general ignorance about what the aims of the discipline are. Um, again, you know, we all face this across our different disciplines, but I think everyone kind of has a, a view on politics, an opinion on politics. Um, and so, you know, people think that I can give kind of, you know, an esoteric explanation of what's going on in my kind of town county politics, um, you know, as well as what's kind of going on in the WTO global governance, as, as well as what's going on in kind of African uh, democratization, which is kind of my main field, uh, African party politics and democratization. Um, and so I think sometimes it's kind of ascribed too much, uh, you know, too much influence uh, to the discipline. Um, which on the plus side, as I've put it, kind of the opportunities, uh, a lot of deference. Uh, you know, we've heard a lot uh, the last two days about the importance of the role of the state, the importance of you know, bringing politics into the discussion. Um, and so I think you know, often in a multidisciplinary environment, there can be um, great benefit for political scientists. Um, secondly, is kind of notice more and more greater flexibility and engagement in development issues than some of my, my colleagues who are kind of considered pure political scientists who might just focus on voting or public opinion issues. So I think the ability to say, for example, how, do you, how does decentralization or local governance structures affect the pattern of urbanization and urban housing markets, um, or how party regimes affect volatility in agricultural policies. Being able to show how politics or governance affects a particular development outcome um, has become quite valuable to me. And then thirdly, just pushing me much more towards policy relevance. Of course, we all need to have our contributions to, you know, theoretical contributions to our discipline. But I think also thinking about how does our work affect the donor community or affect national governments makes us think not just about addressing a gap in the literature, but also, you know, what, what are kind of the issues that are really important to people and to policymakers. 
So how to make it work. Um, as I said, I'm just going to give a, a few just examples from my, from my own experience. Um, one is, is very much what Haruna has already mentioned about this issue of, of language, communication. Um, we always, we know, we, have, we all use kind of different jargon, different terminology. Um, and what I found is really if you can just provide a concrete example of what you're talking about and how does it differ uh, from what your, your multidisciplinary team members are talking about, um, really helps in moving kind of a project forward. So one example that I, I've had over the last two years uh, with IFPRI is with a USAID project focusing on drivers of food security policy change. Um, why do certain policy issues get on the policy agenda in some countries and not others? Um, particularly looking at fertilizer subsidies. Uh, why have some countries chosen different designs to their subsidy programs um, rather than others, et cetera. So our project kind of consists of an array of kind of livelihood specialists, um, agricultural economists, of course, USAID practitioners, and then, and then myself as a political scientist. And when we started doing this research, we said, oh, let's just do a stakeholder mapping. Yes, let's look at the interest groups. And then USAID said, yes, let's look at the, who are the policy champions. And I said, yes, let's look at who the veto players are. Um, and we realized, are we all actually talking about the same thing? These sound like they could be synonymous. Um, and what we basically did is we wound up um, taking a kind of what's called a circle of influence graphic. Um, I think Marilee Grindle at, at MIT has come up with this just kind of graphic presentation. Um, and this is just an example focusing on Ghana's fertilizer subsidy program. Um, and we were just trying to kind of place the different actors involved in discussions of the fertilizer subsidy rate in Ghana, who supported it, who didn't support it, an increase in the subsidy rate, and who just kind of wanted more technical improvements to the program by you know, having more appropriate fertilizer for agroecological conditions. And when we put this up, we realize that, of course, not all stakeholders are interest groups. Um, of course, there's poor people who are stakeholders in this policy, but they're not even on our diagram. Um, and then not all interest groups are policy champions. Um, so, of course, the donor community is a big interest group, but they're not a champion of the subsidy policy. And then the kind of gray area in the middle was focusing on veto players, who are the main decision makers who, at the end of the day, determine this policy. And then, you know, recognizing that not all policy champions are, are the veto players. So this kind of helped us just disentangle that, well, we, we were all actually talking um, about similar things in some regards, but um, the language actually does make a difference. Secondly, humbly justifying your value added, and I think this is again, um, plays on another point um, that Haroon made about kind of delving into other literatures. Um, I think we've all kind of, so we're sometimes often a little bit derisive of, of other disciplines. I've been to many, particularly African studies conferences, we have many different disciplines, and you have kind of political scientists roll their eyes when historians just kind of read their paper word for word. And then you have economists, they get upset that you know, anthropologists engage in this, this kind of rich, thick description, but no kind of rigorous, quote unquote, hypothesis testing. Um, and then there's also kind of the, the feeling about uh, you know, economists becoming kind of so obsessed with uh, you know, testing endogeneity that they really might lose sight of what's the bigger topic or issue that they're looking at. Um, so we kind of, you know, we're all kind of used to this uh, kind of rolling of the eyes at, at cer certain instances, but I think it's really important to stay open-minded and self-reflective of the, your own discipline to gain credibility with other disciplines. Um, and so one example of this was with a UNU wider project that's just actually recently concluded, where we were looking at Africa's emergent middle class and the political economy of the emergent middle class. And of course, a lot of economists have focused on this a lot recently. Um, African Development Bank a few years ago kind of reinvigorated attention to this issue. Um, and then we have many economists, Martin Revalian, Nancy Birdsall, William Easterly, focusing on how you, me how you measure the middle class. Um, and I think what, what got lost sight of, what we realized kind of doing this project, is that there's been a huge kind of historical and sociological literature on Africa's middle class back to the 1960s and 70s. So this is not a new phenomenon. There's been a lot written on it already that was kind of ignored by um, more, more kind of contemporary research on the topic. 
Um, but at the same time, there wasn't much on the political science front. And so one of the goals of this work was to kind of show what these different disciplines were showing us, the lessons learned, the importance of those lessons, but what was the value added of, of applying also a political uh, lens to the work. I think thirdly, avoiding the, the lowest common denominator. Um, I think that one of the biggest challenges, I think, with multidisciplinary work is that we tend to kind of sacrifice the depth because we're trying to get the breadth from the work um, and result, results in a lot of kind of essays and X, fill in whatever the X is, uh, essays in gender, essays in youth, uh, whatever, whatever topic you want to fill in with the X, um, which kind of concludes usually with the point that context matters. Um, or I kind of read, I've read two days ago about a, a very, uh, very large multidisciplinary project where the conclusion was context matters, but only within certain contexts. So you kind of get these kind of somewhat vague conclusions um, in some cases. Um, and so I think one thing that we learned from a, a project we recently did on African youth, also a UNU uh, project, um, was that you really need to have a, like a very, a very clearly defined issue up front from which a bigger mes message across all disciplines can be derived, but then giving the space for each discipline to then derive different subsets of issues. So in this project, we had urban anthropologists, we had education specialists, um, political scientists, sociologists, labor economists, um, a whole wide range. Um, but we asked them all to focus on what's kind of the conventional wisdom that you're trying to test. Um, is it about that all African youth are apathetic? Is it that they're all violent in front of protest? Is it that they, um, you know, they could benefit from more of a focus on changes in educational curriculum, more towards vo vocational education? Is it about uh, having more kind of learnership programs um, or apprenticeship programs? Um, and so they all kind of started out with these types of conventional wisdoms, and then they they. They were kind of testing them with their own methods, um, draw, drawing on their own literature. So at the end of the day, they could still kind of stay in their comfort zone uh, with their work, but then we could have kind of a bigger message that came out of the work. And then I think lastly, um, just being cognizant that we certainly all do have different objectives in our work. Um, and we all have different metrics for gauging, as researchers in particular, our, our productivity, and we prioritize different publication outlets. Um, so oftentimes, you know, oftentimes we prioritize our own disciplinary journal, for example, um, than maybe a kind of a development studies outlet. So I think one option is to anticipate kind of a two-pronged strategy up front for your research outputs that ensures team building, ensures everyone's kind of working towards a common end, um, but then you, without sacrificing personal objectives, um, particularly on the publication side, and discussing these well in advance uh, with, with project members. Some of the kind of worst projects I've been involved in is when it's kind of <laughs> You know, a month before completing, when people say, what, what are we going to do with this research? And everyone has a very different, different opinion about what they want to do with it because they all, you know, they all have their checks they need to cross uh, in terms of uh, their own career objectives and publications. So I think, um, and, and Francis was just alluding this as well, I mean, I think one of, the, one of the issues is finding out ways that you don't just have kind of co-authored projects. Um, where you wind up having each person writing their own section of the paper or the, or the book, um, and then someone else needs to kind of bring it all together and see what the common thread is. But really kind of working more towards kind of co-authored uh, papers and chapters that show how the, the different disciplines can strengthen each other. So I've put up um, just a few examples here. Um, and these are, of course, all, all deriving from you and you wider work, which I guess is appropriate since we're kind of celebrating um, you and you wider. Um, but one is from, from Rachel and another colleague, Miguel, um, a political scientist and economist, working together to kind of see what this kind of new wave of experimental work um, in methodology, I mean, what are the strengths and weaknesses of using this particular methodology um, in terms of deriving insights for, for good governance and for development economics? Um, a second one, focusing on the political economy of green growth, is where political scientists and economists came together um, okay, to, uh, to look at what the economic implications of green growth 
um, the, whether the, the implications of the green growth agenda that's been, been quite popular for the past few years, uh, what, what's the political feasibility of actually implementing that agenda and finding that there were quite a few kind of uh, political caveats of uh, having kind of a green growth approach to development. And then thirdly, as part of a project that I think is still ongoing, um, the Development Under Climate Change Project at Wider, it's really bringing together economists and natural scientists um, to think about policy implications uh, for climate change and for cutting carbon emissions and showing how kind of economic modeling and energy modeling, uh, which have not been brought together often in the past, um, how they can actually be sequenced and give kind of a bigger bang to the, to the policy um, policy advice. So I think, luckily, you and you wider is very good at promoting this, with the caveat of, of when they have the right balance of staff, uh, when they can draw on a network that that's, uh, includes uh, all of us, of the sociologists, political scientists, economists, anthropologists. So I leave it there. Thank you. Thank you.